Go for it. You can't taste them. Good. So where do I start? Well, I had to make sure. <clears throat> Barb had to ask me if I'd uh, trimmed my beard. I had to make sure she knew I trimmed my beard. But she doesn't want me to. Oh, oh, I could. She wants me to present myself a certain way. But I refuse to button up this shirt so you can't see the red shirt, which she says is the hick shirt. So just think of me as a hick <laughs> doing this. Your red shirt. Huh? We can see a red shirt, isn't it? Oh, that one. Cool. That's all I ever wear. That's a signature shirt. <laughs> That's my signature. Well, here's what I did. <clears throat> There's Gwen. Yeah, she, there she is. About five, six years ago, Advent 2015, so I was working on this before that. I wrote a paper, a document called Genesis Beyond Creationism and Evolution and Evolutionism. I've read some stuff. I got my mind rolling on this idea that there just might be another way of approaching this quandary we have about it's either Genesis or it's evolution, which is it going to be? Right? I mean, that's been out there for so long. And so I came up with something I thought might help get us through that. A different approach that actually I think puts Genesis in the correct perspective so it is useful to us as God's people. Okay, so I'm going to have, I want to build a case here, kind of a mindset that's opposed to the mindset that's out there right now about having to make a choice here. And I'm going to read some other stuff. I've been cramming my head full of stuff since I agreed to do this <laughs> since last Monday. Reread everything I wrote. Uh, how many years ago is that? Five or six years, six mm -hmm. years ago. And then read some more recent stuff. You know, you get stuff so crammed up there. You then have to decram it. <laughs> if you don't decram it, you're not gonna be able to get on tack and stay on task. So, all right. So what I'm gonna do is read my introduction. I wanna be reading from this document, adding some stuff that I've come across and thought through since then. And then hopefully it won't be too dry. There's a lot of stuff in this that's very interesting as a way of understanding Genesis. So I wanna, I'm not going to read the whole book of Genesis. Mike did that last week. But I'm going to read what uh, Eugene Peterson says in his uh, book, The Message. And here's the first two sentences. First, this. Now you notice that's not the same thing as saying in the beginning. First, this. God created the heavens and earth. All you see, all you don't see, earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. Listen to those words. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. And then he goes through and does the usual the days. Okay. So. Let me start with my introduction here. The title of this paper claims to go beyond what is a major debate in Christian circles. Do we explain the origins of the entire natural universe as, uh, and of humankind as a result of a special and sudden supernatural creation, supernatural, I should say, by God as seemingly described in the Bible? Or do we explain these same phenomena as the result of ordinary natural processes that took place over a very long period of time, best described by scientific investigation? Or are there explanations that combine in some other insights from both of these viewpoints? And there are, there are. There are, are there explanations out there trying to combine the two. The first position is often labeled scientific creationism or creation science, something like that, because it asserts the Bible's description of origins, Genesis one and three is factually factually accurate, as any scientific investigation would be. The second position is often labeled materialistic evolutionism, 
because it asserts that modern scientific investigation provides the only, fact, and that's the word, only factually accurate explanation for the origin of the universe and humanity from matter alone. It's matter alone. There's no supernatural out there. Particularly as fossil and genetic evidence strongly suggests that humans have evolved over a long period of time. Now, this is a battle for the beginnings. It's what one book, how one book puts it, between Christians. Not just Christians against the evolutionists, it's between Christians. It can get really heated and even nasty. Creationists often consider fellow Christians who be believe in evolution to be materialistic, secular humanists, or even heretical in their thinking. Christians who affirm the results of scientific investigation as supporting some type of evolutionary development often consider creationists to be anti-intellectual, anti-scientific, or even hypocritical for considering their approach to be science. Further, and Mike alluded to this last, last Monday, Christians who grew up in homes or went to churches that are more conservative or fundamentalist in their theology were often more likely to have been taught to believe that the only correct Christian way to read Genesis was a literal factual description of how the universe and humankind came into existence. And that any so-called non-literal interpretation must be wrong. See, the question there is gonna be what's literal, what's non-literal. Is there something other than literal that's not non-literal? We'll get to that. Unfortunately, tightly linking Christian faith with creation science has led many Christian young people to doubt or even leave their faith when they consider serious criticisms of that linkage. This often happens when they go off to college. It could happen before that. And uh, then they hear things about it. science has disproved that and so forth. You can pick that up in the air. You don't have a class to tell you that. It's in the air. I know someone's done that. You, but do any of you, raise your hand, do you know anybody in your life that's done that? They've kind of lost their faith or anybody? I'm the only one? <laughs> okay. I mean, we have people, sons, daughters, relatives. It's pretty common. Or if they don't leave their faith, question their faith, they might unquestionably accept that mindset. Let me read something to you here from a professor at North Park University in Chicago, which is a Christian college. I think it's still covenant nomination. At North Park University, my colleagues in the Biblical and Theological Studies Department and I, what is he? He teach, oh, okay, I, teach a course called Introduction to the Bible to all incoming freshmen. And here's what's nice about this. On the first day, I give the students a test to assess their biblical knowledge in order to help me know how best to teach them. So he tells them anyway. Here's what I find. Usually every student knows about Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, most students do not get beyond that basic knowledge. Here is this beautiful chapter in the Bible. Chapters. In the first book of the Bible. And all they can get beyond is, well, Adam and Eve. Okay? Which, by the way, is a major source of debate nowadays. Was Adam historical or not? The great debate going on in Christian circles over that. How to question who's Adam? When I asked the question, what is the purpose of the creation narrative? And this is what I'm going to be getting to. It is not uncommon to hear answers like the following: The Bible shows that evolution is wrong. Uh. So it doesn't. It doesn't even mention evolution. The Bible says in no uncertain terms that God created the universe in six 24-hour days. Okay, that seems on the surface could be accurate. 
The Bible shows how Eve, the woman, disobeyed God and brought sin upon man. Remember, who did God speak to about not eating? It was Adam. I'm correct. Therefore, women are makers. Cursed to serve men. How do you like that? The Bible shows how knowledge is bad and faith is good because a woman wanted knowledge instead of trusting in God. So don't let women teach in your church. Okay. This was written in 2008. Not that long ago. So here's what I propose in this paper, which is different to reading Genesis that does the following. I want a different mindset here for us. It claims that Genesis does not address this creationist evolutionist debate. It doesn't it? That's a debate we've only had in the last couple hundred years. It claims that Genesis 1 to 3 is not factual or literal description of how the universe of humanity came into existence that is in opposition to modern scientific explanations on the origins of the universe and humanity. My position is to agree that Genesis 1 to 3 is in opposition to something. It is. But that it is opposing the religious idolatry, the mythologies of that time and place. If my proposal is correct, the Christian doesn't have to choose between Genesis and science. He doesn't have to choose between believing God's word, or as my daughter will say to me, do you believe in evolution? Believe in what sense? And I think, was that like believing in gravity? Give a point. The word belief is being used here in some squirrely ways. My claim is that to focus on this issue in our reading of Genesis will compel us to misread and misinterpret Genesis and divert us from the original purpose for its writing, which just happens to be the purpose for the entire Bible. That's a, this is a change in mindset I'm getting on. I propose that we follow Paul and his conviction to get at this original purpose. This is for 2 Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, let say the woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's assume Paul knows what he's talking about there. Applying this statement to Genesis 1 to 3 will likely give us a different strategy for reading and understanding and interpreting Genesis than many Christians are accustomed to. That is what we might ask of any other scripture portion or passage throughout the Bible. We could ask of Genesis 1 to 3. What is it teaching? What is it rebuking? What is it correcting? What is it training? What righteousness and good work is the reader of Genesis to be thoroughly equipped for? Now, I decided to add, I don't have this original, but I, I want to add this. This really, I think, for me, Romans 12, 2 is kind of pro programmatic. It gets at so much of what scripture is about and what God is doing to try to transform us. So we have to, my point is, we have to liberate our minds here from captivity to the traditional battle for the beginnings so it might do what it's designed to do at a transformational level. If Genesis is there to transform us in some way, which I believe it is, just like anything else in scriptures. We got to liberate it from this battle that's going on and this mindset keeps us in captivity. So Romans 12, 2, I'm just going to throw this out for you to think about. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. What pattern of this world 
the people in Genesis 1 conforming to. And they started conforming to the pattern of this world. Once they got liberated from Egypt, they went into Canaan. And in the prophets, they've never gotten fully liberated from that pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'm suggesting that's exactly what's being done here. Trans renewing our mind. We've got to get God straight, what God wants for us, his purposes for us. Because if we don't, we will default to the mindset we're most accustomed to hearing. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So don't conform to the pattern of this world, the world's mindset, idolatry, injustice, immorality, clear throughout the scriptures. That's what God is wanting his people to not do. And to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will for us. I would suggest we probably have a, have a hard time doing that, knowing his will. We get it all tied up into this mindset that we almost inevitably at least really share some of. Anyway, Romans 12, 2. So to get back on track here, I gotta move along here. We don't have much time. How long do we have? Two hours? Three hours? <laughs> No? Two hours. Two hours? Sure. It's not two hours. <laughs> Quit trying to trick me. You could probably listen to you for two hours. I don't know. Let's hope so. Note also that the Second Timothy passage makes no claim that the purpose of Scripture is to establish the historical or scientific credibility of any scripture passage, including Genesis 1 to 3. In other words, Genesis does not give us any arguments to prove God's existence, does not give us any historical scientific facts to support what it portrays, does not present, present its position in a logically coherent propositional manner, as you would find in any textbook on history or a scientific subject. Genesis fails that, fails that, I think, if you want to say that's portraying for us something that's scientifically, logically true. So I would say that Genesis 1 and 3 is a truthful and trustworthy doing what exactly what 2 Timothy claims is the purpose of Scripture. To build God's people up in the character purposes of God so that God's people can resist all sorts of idolatry, including our modern idolatries. Does this mean there's no historical scientific dimension? No. There was historical and cultural and geographical context in which it was written that can help us understand it according to the purposes for which it was written on its context. Oh, how are we doing on time? <laughs> building a, I'm building a case here. Oh, was someone going to say something? To carry this point further, let us use the term grand narrative to refer to the Bible's literary framework for communicating God's purpose in Scripture. Christopher Wright, in his magisterial study on the mission of God in a book by that title, states that the Bible's grand narrative, he's an Old Testament scholar, written on a lot of stuff from the Old Testament. And he's saying that the overall perspective of the various books are to be understood, interpreted it in his own terms. Our committed participation as God's people and God's invitation and command and God's own mission within the history of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. You like that? I like that. Our committed participation as God's people, God's invitation and command, and God's own mission within the history of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. Do 
Paul did something similar to this in Romans 1. Let's see, let me get it out here. Read Romans 1 from the message. But God's angry displeasure erupts as humans mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate, accumulate as people try to put the shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes, and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of divine being. So nobody has an excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but they didn't treat him like God. Refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but were, were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines we can buy at any road st roadside stand. That's pretty blunt. Mm -hmm. Now he was addressing that to the Gentiles of his time but I think we have reason to believe that goes beyond the Gentiles of his time. Conrad Myers wrote a book some years ago called The Meaning of Creation. This is so good. I have a hard time turning away stuff that's so good. I feel derelict if I do that. And this follows up on what Paul was saying. This is a very important point. The religions of antiquity, like the tribal religions that preceded them, sensed a kind of universal divine presence. Let's assume that. Yet that sacred presence was fragmented into a great many individual spirits or divinities, each with its own personality sphere of influence. Let's see, can I move along here? Nevertheless, a sense of divine Divine unity did not stand out and was not the point of focus. What had impressed itself upon early peoples was the visible, tangible presence of a plurality of sacred forces. In a peculiar sense, ancient religion was incarnational. Divinity was embodied and experienced in the forms of the cosmos. cosmos. In this religious milieu, however, no particular spirit or deity was fully capable of either transcendence or eminence. Each was too closely identified with one or another aspect of the natural order to transcend it decisively. By the same token, each was eminent only in that region for which it was identified. It is only with the emergence of biblical monotheism that one is giving a, given a thoroughgoing transcendence and eminence. And then you got to think of Jesus, of course. Transcendent, imminent, the incarnation. I like that. Can we say there's reason to believe that there were fragmentary glimpses of God back prior to Genesis? Well, Probably so, because some of the mythologies and the religious claims go back way into history with Egypt and Mesopotamia. They were there for a while, quite a while actually, before Genesis was written. So to go back to Romans 1, what if Genesis is the beginning, the beginning of God's long polemical argument with humankind that he and he alone is the Lord God, the only God worthy of ultimate human worship than the worship and service of created things. Uh, suppose I left something out, but I don't care now. We're just gonna keep moving on. 
So if we put the concerns of Genesis 1 to 3 in more modern phraseology, and this is what John Walton suggests, no, yeah. There's some questions we can ask of ourselves. It answers the four fundamental life questions that all religions, life philosophies, worldviews, moral systems, even political ideologies, respond to or reflect on in one way or another. So these are the questions. Where are we? What is the nature of the world around us? Answer. We inhabit the earth, which is part of the good creation of the one living personal God, Yahweh. Who are we? What is the essential nature of humanity? Are we just more evolved animals? You get the idea. We are human beings made in God's, made by God in God's own image. What of God's creatures, but unique among them in spiritual and moral relationship and responsibility? What's gone wrong? Why is the world such a mess? Through rebellion and disobedience against our creator God, we have now generated the mess that we see around us at every level of our lives, relationships, and environment. What is the solution? What can we do about it? Nothing in and of ourselves, but the solution has been initiated by God through his choice and creation of a people, Israel. To whom he intends, to whom God intends to bring blessings to all the nations of the earth, and ultimately to renew the whole creation. I want to add a question there. I want to add something that he didn't have in his. This is a very important point, I think. Is God basically for us or against us? Is he basically for us or is he against us? I think a lot of Christians, especially on the conservative fundamentalist side, come out of the gates saying God is against us. We have sin, we're sinners. Until we get right with God, we, we are of no good to God. Well, there's truth to that. But what came before Adam and Eve disobeyed God? What was there before all that happened? All this goodness, this good creation, this habitat for humanity, I call it, that God was creating for Adam and Eve. That was there. It was good. God bless it. It was good. It was good. It was good. So you get what I'm trying to get at here. That's an important point. What, how do we start with that understanding what scripture is about? Because that will also affect how we think of Genesis. Okay, let me take a short breath here. Some water. Everybody okay? Yeah. Rich, this is yeah. Gwen. Yeah. I have a question in mm -hmm. the very beginning. I am fine. I'm fine. Are you hungry? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not what I answered. You should have muted. What was it? Sure. Who, who is speaking? Who's freaking or who's speaking? Oh, okay. I, I, I'm starting to freak. Question, Rich, if if I'm not interrupting. Uh in the very beginning uh, of your talk, you mentioned something and it kind of surprised me because I always thought you were a very enlightened person. <laughs> and when I heard you say that you almost lost your faith because of the conflict between- hmm. No, I didn't lose my faith. Oh, oh, okay, I missed, that's what I wanted to hear again. No, I have been a Christian since age 17. So what was- uh, issue between science and the seven-day creation? Oh, I read it. It's been out there for who knows how long. For decades. Decades and decades. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Well, we know well, that. You come on in almost any church that's really conservative or fundamentalist. That's what you're going to get. Uh, that's why I ask, because many yeah. of my, I, I have colleagues who firmly believe that, but I yeah. always, my personal self, I have always thought of God as the greatest scientific mind in the world, <laughs> the creator of all things. How could he be less than the most scientific? And so there's never been an issue in my mind. But I hear but. my friends who I grew up with, and they are very conservative, seven-day creationists. Uh -huh. Well, uh, let me say this. You don't have to choose. I, won't, I would not agree with you, and we need to move on here, that mm -hmm. God is the greatest scientist. I agree. He sometimes is considered to be a proto-scientist, like he's up there doing scientific type stuff. But is he really doing science? And that's what we'll be getting to here in a minute. Okay? I'm giving you a different mindset. Let me get through that mindset, and then we can come back to questions when I get done here. So quick. Okay. okay. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Uh, oh. I'm going to read this from Peter Ann's in his commentary on Exodus, because this supports what I'm trying to get at. The Old Testament is not a journalistic, dispassionate, objective account of events. Its purpose is to not just tell us what happened, so we can look objectively at the data and arrive at the proper conclusions. <clears throat> the Old Testament is theological history. It's been written to teach us lessons. The primary lesson I would argue to is to teach us what God is like and what it means for his people to live with that knowledge. What God is like, his character, his purposes, his, his mindset. If I could put it another way, the Bible is an argument against God's people. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's an argument to God's people that God is worthy of our worship. Think about that. God was always arguing with his, it's a long argument, all the way through the Old Testament. Into the New Testament. God was always having to contend with these, what, strong necked or whatever it is, you know, these boneheads that were his followers, always trying to set them correct. Like to put it another way, the Bible is an argument to God's people that God is worthy of our worship. It is not designed really to set out objective data. It is a deeply spiritual book that has deeply personal implications. It is not a book to be held at a distance, but a book that the interpreter is required to enter into because it is God's book and we are his people. That the Bible is such a purpose should rightly affect the types of questions we bring to that reading, which in turn affects our interpretation of the text. We must be careful to expect from the Bible only those things it is prepared to yield. It is not a science textbook or an owner's manual. It is a book about God and his creation. It is about who he is, who we are, and how the former determines the standing of the latter. I don't know how many times over the years, and this always frustrates me, but I keep my mouth shut. When people treat it, you just, people treat it as a science book or as an owner's manual. Everything you need to know is in the Bible about how to Run a marriage. Everything you need to know in the Bible is how to fix yourself. You don't need counselors. Psychology is a nemesis for a lot of Christians. We're the bad guys. Uh, so if it's not that, then we got to get back to what it is. And that's what he's speaking to here. Okay. I'm going to skip that too. Skip that. Now let's get to the really juicy part. God and stuff, Genesis 1, 1 to 2. I was doing counseling with a girl once, a young girl, teenager, I think. Somehow we got, all, we got on to her faith. She said, yeah, I believe in God and stuff. And when I heard that, I believe in God and stuff. What's the stuff she believed in? What is that stuff? So, let 
Belief in God is not God in stuff. The stuff is what he's putting down in the first six days of creation of his of Genesis. To believe in God is to choose or allow to be, or allow God to be the chief source of our values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. To follow him the same manner that Jesus called his disciples to follow him. To follow God is to be transformed. Remember Romans 12 too. So as to not be conformed to all the other principles and practices, whether it's political, economic, cultural, religious, etc., that claim to be chief sources of how humans are to center or ground their existence. Romans 12, 2. Now, here's a very interesting passage in the Bible. With this in mind, read the following exhortation by Moses as he prepares Israel to enter the promised land reminding them of God's word to them at Mount Sinai or Herod in the Exodus from Egypt. It's a very interesting passage. It's in Deuteronomy 4, 15 and 19. With this in mind, I mean, you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Sinai out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. I italicize that because, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether form like a man or a woman, or like any animal on earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground, or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up at the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not get enticed, tempted, to bowing down to them and worshiping things that your God is a portion to the nations under heaven. Now, that's a reverse order, but what is he saying? The first six days of the Genesis, he's going to be debunking all those things, and then he says, watch yourselves carefully that you don't move back, get tempted to be come back into that frame of mind. So Moses states that the stuff of creation is pretty, it's pretty complete. Humans, animals, fish, you name it, birds, the waters, everything in the sky. The stuff of creation is a set of potential temptations to sidetrack Israel's worship and service, of which Israel is to not conform to. We all understand what idolatry is, basically. It's to give something, the power, the potency, the presence with us that only God should be given to God. Okay? So I'll skip over that. And these things could be things we make, things we just admire, it could be artistic, it could be almost anything you can imagine. It could become a, a center of our existence. And there's lots of books on this. At the altar of Wall Street, that's a, I got a bunch of my office. Uh, America and its guns is all about how we vitalize guns, hidden worldviews, all those world worldviews floating around out there that we can start idolizing. Idols of our time, that's an older book. And Harvey Cox, this is so, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read the whole article, but it's an inter interesting article. It came out in 1999. It's called The Market as God. The market has God. And what he does, very nicely, I think, is take a hard look at the free market system, capitalism. And what he says here could also be said of communism, socialism. They all did the same thing, basically. And see, what's going on here? How is this taking over our lives? How is it? 
how has it taken over our lives? He says, the divine omnip, he tried to do it in terms of omnip, omnipotence, starts there. It means the capacity to define what is real. It is the power to make something out of nothing, nothing out of something. I think of, I think of uh, social media. The will but not yet achieve omnipotence of the market means that there is no conceivable limit to its inexorable ability to convert creation into commodities. Think about that, commodities. Everything out there could be turned into a commodity, be sold, bought, sold. It goes on and on about that. A lot of good material. Now, this thinking assigns to the market a comprehensive wisdom that in the past only the gods have known. The market we are taught is able to determine what human needs are and what these copper and capital should cost, how much barbers and CEOs should be paid, and how much jet planes, running shoes, and hysterectomies should sell for. No. Huh? Hmm. Think about that through our culture. Uh -huh. That's his definition of omnipresence. Omniscience. You know, there's books on this now and papers on this, with social media, Facebook and everything else on there. They know what you are thinking, despite what you go on to when you do that. And they know what you want. And they know what political parties you're inclined to. And they know all that stuff that you think is it just in your head. They have algorithms that tell them who you are and what you are and where you are and all that stuff. We're so used to it, we're maybe not frightened by that. All right, the last one. On this, this omniscience can sometimes seem a bit intrusive. The, tr the traditional God of the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer is invoked as one who unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. He says the market already knows what your deepest secrets are and your darkest desires. And then lastly, omnipresent. As you know, this modern electronic world is everywhere. He says, you know, the religion of the market has become the most formidable rival, the more so because it rarely recognized as a religion. Watch yourselves very carefully, he says. All right, I'm gonna go on from this. Very good article. It's scary to think through what people know about us. All right. Anybody know where I'm at? Come on, come on. So we're in Genesis 1 and 2. That's what I'm in right now. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says there in the beginning, 
Eugene Peterson said, first this, this first, what did he say? God. So here's what I'm going to say about that. Lots of people, lots of like John Watton, Collins, a whole bunch of exegetes out there are saying, you know, in the beginning doesn't mean in the beginning. In the beginning of what? John Walton says, in the beginning of what? Time, history, everything. Well, not everything, because God is before the everything. Time is in, in the beginning, in the beginning. And he suggests, and a lot of others do too, that what God is saying and what Genesis is saying there is that it's, it's a literary introduction. It's the beginning of a sequence of verses and chapters that has an ending to it. It's the beginning of a drama, six days. Bonhoeffer gets, gets at this when he states that, that, that in the beginning, not be understood as a chronological sense, but as God confronting the human pretense that we are the beginning, the ultimate source of meaning, purpose, guidance, or strength in our own human existence. That's what it's getting at, okay? You're not the beginning. I'm the beginning. That's a hard lesson to take for most of us. We're not the beginning of our lives. So, we're going to be running out of time here pretty quick, and I'm not even one tenth of the way through. So, then we get the six days. God, God in the days of our lives. That's how I titled that years ago. This is one, three to 15. Or 25, I mean, I'm sorry. So, and this is what Myers has to say, Conrad Myers. In the light of this historical context, it becomes clear that Genesis 1 is undertaking and accomplishing a radical and sweeping affirmation of monotheism vis-a-vis -vis the polytheism, syncretism, and idolatry of its day. Each day of creation, takes on two principal categories of divinity in the pantheons of the day and declares that these are not gods at all, but creatures. Creation is the one true God who's the only one without a second or third. On the first day, the gods of light and darkness are dismissed. There's light and then there was darkness, okay? The second day, the gods of sky and sea. By then, astrology was probably the most common type of religion in the ancient Near East. Astrology, and it still is for a lot of people. Looking at the stars for guidance. Seeing, earth, seeing gods and goddesses up there. The third day, earth gods and gods of vegetation. On the fourth day, the sun, moon, and the stars. And see, that's an issue that's always befuddled people. On day one, we got light, but we don't get the things that cause light until day four. To day four, how can that be? Let's try to figure out how that can be. But if this is correct, this is not how these things are supposed to be. This is how they are being demoted. They're being de. This word I want here, demoted, degraded to something that's a simple creational phenomenon, not gods, not goddesses. And you notice this when God says the greater light and the lesser light, he didn't name sun and moon, he could have. He's demoting it right there by saying that. So the fifth and sixth days take away any association with divinity from the animal kingdom. And finally, human existence, that's the sixth day, is emptied of any intrinsic divinity. Even we aren't divine. We are made in the image of the divine. 
So what we have here, I got to much longer, do we? So what we have here is Genesis is being written in an already familiar seven day chronological framework to polemicize the full range of idolatry extant in the context of Genesis. In other words, God is declaring himself to be in opposition over against the universe of idolatry. Think about that. It's not about creating the universe like we usually think. He's opposing the universe of idolatry out there. He did that then by, in a subtle kind of polemical way, saying all these things are simple creational phenomena, light and dark and moon and sun. They're not divinities. And even people aren't. People back then thought they were divinities. And by doing this, why the seven days? Why seven days? Did God create seven days? Yeah, I need six days to get this done, then I can rest. You know, we've heard about that. Did he need seven days? No, seven days was already a common calendar by that time. Started way back in Mesopotamia, the seven days. And how'd they get their calendar? Sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars. What else is up there? Saturn. There are a bunch of celestial planets that they could observe. It was seven that they came up with. So he uses days, the first days. God uses the day framework to come against these idolatries. And Bonhoeffer says this too. I like Bonhoeffer. He says, the day has its own being, its own form, its own power. It is not to be understood in physical terms as the rotation of the earth around the sun or as the change of darkness and light that can be calculated on a period of time. Something beyond that, something that determines the essence of the world and of our existence. It is, one might say, the term did not suit the context here so badly, what we call a mythological entity. To be sure, the gods of the day and of the night who in pagan belief animate and fill the world are wholly, de wholly dethroned. The day, never, nevertheless, remains God's first creature, something wondrous and mighty in God's hand. Okay, I'm going to turn this around. This is not about astrology and all that. These are the days in my hand that I can use to declare these things about the con in the context that Israel was in. Then you get a whole bunch of, you can go through the Bible, and you know, I got uh, Deuteronomy 30 here. This is when Moses is ending up his uh, career, you might say. He says, I set before you today life and prosperity. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and keep his commands, decrees, and laws. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods, worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live and long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This day I call the heavens and earth. This is interesting. The heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life and so forth. The word today has become used in the Old Testament. This is throughout the Psalms, other Old Testament passages, the day of atonement. It was one day, but that was a day that lasted. It was to set in motion a certain type of worship among by the Israelites. 
And this goes on and on and on. So we have to think about what the word day here means. Is it literally a seven day, six days? They were 24 hour days. Let's assume that. They were 24 hours a day. I, I assume that, 24 hour days. But designed to couch God's message to us in the way I've just described. So the main issue there is not some kind of chronological thing like Bonhoeffer said. Could be. So, I could probably finish up here. I have some more stuff here on God gets his act together. You know what that is? God gets his act together. Adam and Eve in his image. He needs some people to represent him on the earth. Male and female gets his act together. What happens in this section of Genesis 2 to 3 is no play acting. God's dead serious call on humans to have a responsive relationship to him, to take upon themselves a particular responsibility as his agents, and to curtail their resistance to that call. All three of those are important there. Okay, I got stuff I can say about image and likeness, but I think Mike covered that some degree last time. Male and female. Cultural mandate. The blessing is very good. Oh, so much. Who said I had an extra hour? All right, I think I'll stop there. Like I said, I had to decram my brain, got to leave stuff out. So that's what I'm doing along here. There's another angle in this. Let me just get this out there real quick. This is from Derek Kidner. He wrote this in his, gen his Genesis commentary, 1982, I think it was. It's been a long time ago. He goes to what paleontology tells us about what was present before Genesis came about, the writing of Genesis. What was already there in the, pre in the civilizations of that place and time. And there was tons of stuff already there. Then he says this. This is really a radical proposal, but it's one that's being followed now by quite a few Old Testament scholars. If as the text of Genesis would by no means disallow, God initially shaped man by a process of evolution it would follow that a considerable stock of near humans preceded the first true man. And it would be arbitrary to picture these as mindless brutes. These are guys in the stone edge running around clubbing people, all that stuff, right? They're not mindless brutes. Nothing requires that the creature into which God breathed human life should not have been a species prepared in every way for humanity with a already a long history of practical intelligence, artistic sensibility, and the capacity for awe and reflection. They somehow knew there was a presence. And so we are to assume, he says, that the contemporaries of Adam and Eve were creatures of comparable intelligence, widely distributed over the world. And that's why it's sound pretty radical right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then he says this, and then I'll finish with that. We have established the first pair of God's vice reasons, first human pair, the first. 
it is at least conceivable that after the special creation of Eve, which established the first human, human pair, and clinched the fact that there is no natural bridge from animal to man, God may have now conferred his image on Adam's collaterals to bring them into the same realm of being. He goes on and on about that. So that is something I want to make sure I can get across. And there's a lot on that now, on the historical Adam. A lot of books written on that now, of Adam historical. You know, he could be historical. Of course, he was. He and she were. But that doesn't mean they were, they were the only historical people that God would have been speaking to, making his presence known to. That's the ones that we have in our scriptures, the context of Israel, the Hebrews. I got to stop. If I don't, I'll just keep going and we'll be into the eighth, ninth, and tenth days here before we know it. All right. Questions? I have a question, and it might just be my misunderstanding or not understanding. Um, I don't understand what the big debate is between six 24-hour days and six of God's days. In the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? Well, it's a big debate. We have an yeah. younger why does and it older. Matter? Why does it matter? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I've never had a problem with it. Either one is fine with me. It didn't matter to me. Then you are in the same place I'm at. But yeah, I just wondered of, what the big deal is. I couldn't figure it out. A lot of Christians out there think it's going to be seven days, young earth. God created everything about, what, 6,000 years ago now? 4,000, 6,000? You know? That's why it's a big deal. Because that doesn't line up with how old the earth is and how old the civilizations are oh. that were encountered by the Israelites. So we got oh, a problem. Okay. Okay. We got a problem. It, has, it can't be six, seven literal days that were only 24 hours. And that's what God took to create everything. What if God, I like, I don't know who, I can't remember who said this. What if God had created the earth and everything in it prior to the writing of Genesis? And Genesis is simply affirming that God has created. Not how he did it, but that he did it. The point is, do we take the six days of creation and turn those into a how? Okay, this is how God did it. And then we got to argue about how he did it and how many days, and which days, and deal with all these issues. Or do we take it as a declaration of who God is? That makes more sense. Yeah. See, I think it gets us away from the proper focus for Genesis. It's going to be hard to use it as a... Well, I'm going to say pastoral. A theological, God is declaring who he is, what he wants of us. Adam and Eve didn't follow through on that, so now he has to deal with that. And then we start in the whole rest of the Pentateuch. Whole rest of Genesis, think about it. Abraham came from where? Mesopotamia. He had to also be cleared of all the idolatries he would have been encountered in Mesopotamia before he got to Canaan. See, see what we're getting at? So the mm -hmm. point is, it's not about the how. How many years? It's the what. Who is God? What is God what of us? What is he creating us for? If you read Genesis, you read it. He's creating us to be a faithful vice reason, vice region in the habitat mm -hmm. for humanity that the days were preparing for us. This habitat for humanity, being prepared for us to be his vice regents. And that's where you get the idea that the temple, that uh, the day of rest was a installation of a temple, 
in the Garden of Eden. And there are other sources back in those days that that's something that was done by pagans. Okay, so everything that's being said here is got some basis in good historical theological study of the context for Genesis. And my whole point in this thing is to say, look, if we stick with that, how many days? How old's the earth? We stick with that, especially the young earth thing. And that's going to get us away from what the purpose of Genesis really is. So I hope that's clear. <laughs> As a mindset. Crystal. Crystal? God. No, they weren't doing crystals. Like that. <laughs> Beginning of maybe clarity someday. But it's just, it's something I've always thought about, but it's. Is there like something like this for dummies? I mean, I'm not dumb. But it's hard. I'll it if there is. <laughs> yeah, but it's hard to wrap my head around everything you're saying, which I try to understand. You know why it's hard to wrap your head around it? Why? Because you've got this other mindset. We've all been trained in it, acclimated to it. We've all been taught how to read Genesis. This is a different mindset, and different mindsets can take time to sink in and move us in a different direction. So I want to know, where can I, go? first of all, I'll have to listen to this again, okay. and probably again, but where is it safe to go to read discussions or to read information like this? Okay, I'll make a list of several books, not a whole bunch. Several books. You know what I would read first? It's really, it's not about Genesis. Andy Crouch. Anybody read anything by him? Andrew Crouch? There's a book called Culture Making. Okay, that comes out of Genesis, Culture Making. God created us to establish civilization. Culture Making. And then a more recent book called Playing God. Power, playing God. Now, those aren't commentaries on Genesis. They don't touch on exactly everything I've just said. I can give you some books for that. I'll write some down and pass them on to uh, Tyler or Jim, and they can pass those on to you guys. But I would start with something. These, those books will help you wrap your head around a different perspective on God and how we play God try to do that back then in Genesis. Culture making. Anyway, I'll, I'll do that. I'll make this available to anybody who wants it, okay? I can't guarantee I'll find something for dummies, but maybe I'll come close to it. <laughs> <laughs> Tremper, uh, Tremper, Longman's, Tremper Longman's book, How to Read Genesis, is a nice brief. Okay. If you're looking for kind of uh, just what is this genre? What the heck is going on in Genesis? But is it, does it get to the same kind of thing I'm trying to get at. I haven't read that book. Yeah, yeah. It Who does is it, does it. Tyler? Uh, his name's Tremper Longman. He's an Old, Old Testament scholar. I guess, obviously, maybe not, obviously. <laughs> but it's, you know, the, there's other ones that go more in depth, but his is a, a brief kind of just, here's, here's what the heck's going on in Genesis. Does he get to the point I'm trying to make? I think so, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. That's good. So I don't know if there's any one book that does that, but I will scan my library and see what I can think of. Does, has anybody read Mike's book? Rediscovering the Bible? Does it touch on this subject? Well, his I don't, I don't talk know. last Monday did. Yeah. So, clarify the context and what Genesis was about. He's trying to get away from this young earth older business too. Right. So I don't know if he, that's why I said last week, I'm gonna do something more radical. I don't know if I, if he could, would get to the point or if he did, of uh, Adam and Eve, like I said, being two humans and he had other humans. God was making himself known across the earth. Hmm. It was fragmented. All these fragments of God's presence 
Is he this? Is he that? Is that? Is he the stars? Is he the whatever? So I don't know if he did that or not. That's why I considered this might be a little bit more radical. Because you know what I'm doing here? I'm trying to say, hey, look, this is about how, this is about God. Think about it. God said, God said, God said. This is about God. And it's not about scientific, historical affirmation of what's being said in those chapters in Genesis there. Nothing about that at all. Nothing about that. And I'm saying that we got to focus on getting back to what I asked earlier, God basically for us or against us. If you did in context, God is for us. Creating us in his image. How more for us could God be? He didn't do that for anybody else. Any other animals or anything. Well, I know a good book to read. <laughs> you kind of have to kind of squirrel through it, and that's Narnia series by C.S. Oh, Lewis. Oh. Especially the last battle. The last battle. You see, what is, where are they going to? Ripper Chief was already there waiting for, not Susan. Susan defaulted on her faith, but the others. Yeah, the last battle is a good one to see. All right, what's the possibility here? You know, just loosen up our brains a little bit here. See, I'm saying we're, we're so accustomed, so I'd almost say brainwashed, ingrained, that there's a certain way of looking at Genesis that we might miss its central point. God's purpose for us. And that's why I like Crouch's books. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate your your class tonight. That Thank was you. interesting. Any other questions? Myrna? Oh, I don't Thanks, have a Rich. question. Just a comment. I was oh. just going to say that from the very beginning of humankind and the story of Adam and Eve, and then the quotes that you gave us in Romans, is that we've always seemed to be trading treasures for trinkets. And I like that phrase because we have God and all the beauty of God and forgiveness, but we still trade treasures for trinkets for other things that deem sometimes more important. That's and true. We lose true. the blessing. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. What was the last word? Okay. John chapter one, Peterson calls it the life light. Think mm -hmm. of this in terms of what we just read from Genesis. The word was first, it's referring to Jesus. But God had the first word back in Genesis. The word present to God, God present to the world. The, world, the word was God in readiness for God from day one. Mm -hmm. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing came into being without him. Mm -hmm. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness couldn't put it out. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rich. Thanks, You're Rich. Welcome. Enjoy yourselves with this. <laughs> hey, I'm going to leave now, I guess, right? Yep. Leaving? Yeah, Jim, do we have a, what's a, anything on the docket mm -hmm. next week? You know, um, I think Joe Betridge is going to be with us and talk about the Joseph saga in Genesis. And if I'm incorrect on that, then it's my week and I'm talking about Jacob, but I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> well, I think Joe's yeah, going to be with us. Monday. Yeah, I think Joe will be with us next week. All righty. Sounds good. Yep. Goodbye, everybody. Good Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye Beth.